Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco for Sky and Telescope magazine, and today I'm with Vic Maris, founder and president of Stellaview, a company whose name has become increasingly synonymous with premium refractors and wide-field astrographs in recent years. For viewers who may be familiar with some of the interviews we've done in the past, this one will be a little bit different. I've spoken with Vic at venues like the Northeast Astronomy Forum where he has showed me the latest telescopes that the company has been producing. And while we'll be looking at some of those later today, this is going to be a little different. We're in Auburn, California at the headquarters of Stellaview, and Vic is going to give us a behind the scenes look at how they make their objectives, and more importantly, how they turn what would be a regular high quality refractor into a premium instrument. So we're now in the shop where the creation of these objectives begin. Yes, this is our VF3 CNC machine, and we can use this machine to take strips of glass and cut them into discs. And then once the discs are cut, we can curve generate that disc. We, in other words, we can make the curves on both sides of the glass. So, so we take it from this block to a, uh, a good lens like. All right, so you're using this machine to actually machine the glass. Yes, we're machining the glass with diamond cutting tools. And so once the disc is cut, then we take the machine and a touch probe. We indicate it in on that disc, and then we can start putting the curves in to each side of the glass. Yeah, so once you've got a disc, the machine needs to know precisely where that disc is so it can put the curves in the right spot. Exactly, and we're ready to do that now. We've got a disc in place. Let's go ahead and indicate it in using our touch probe. All right. Oh, that's very cool. That'll work. So here is the finished product as it comes out of the CNC machine. Um, it is curve generated on both sides. This one is concave. This one's convex. And you can see it's got ridges going across yep. it. Those ridges will need to be ground out. So from here, we go over to grinding. But of course, before we do that, we've got to make grinding tools to grind each surface. And we'll mm. do that over there. All right, so these are your grinding tools. Yeah, actually, yes. These are our grinding tools, and this is one of our polishing tools. You'll notice the grinding tools are made out of cast iron. The polishing tools are made out of aluminum. So this is a concave surface which we put pitch into. The grinding tools grind directly onto the glass. Uh, and we have this pattern that we machine into these to move the grit uh, into the center. So you actually have to machine the curve into these tools, very much like we saw the glass blank, you have to put the opposite curve in them. That's right. And we actually make these tools here using our Haas VF2. So now that we're here in the grinding and polishing area, um, we take the blank that we curve generated and we grind it on our grinding machine using those iron tools that we made. So we're gonna grind this smooth, but in that process, we're also going to be continually checking with a spherometer to make sure that we have the right curve. And we're also going to uh, measure its thickness to get it at the right thickness as we go through the grinding process. Once we're through the grinding process, uh, our blank looks like this. It's got, kind of, it's got a very smooth surface, actually has the perfect curve, but of course it's smoky looking because it's ground down to nine microns. So from there we go to polishing, and once the uh, blank is polished, then it looks like this, shiny. Uh, from there, uh, we, uh, we do all of our testing to bring this thing up to an optical null. Uh, I just want to ask, people are looking and probably wondering why it looks blue here. Oh, you have yeah. tape on the back side, mm -hmm. and that's... That's right. That's to protect the other surface, because we've gone ahead and polished the other surface, so now when we're polishing this surface, we want to make sure we're not going to damage that other surface. So here we are now polished. 
but were not optimized. This lens has been optimized. I think next we should talk about that. So at this point, again, curve generating on a machine, grinding and polishing, and then the real magic begins. All right, so what are you talking about when you're saying you're going to optimize it? Optimization that we do is done in our testing room, and we can head over there and look at that. But before we do, I think I need to mention a few things uh, during the processes that we've done. We don't just grind and polish this glass. At every step of the process, we have to stop, we have to clean off the glass, we have to take it down and inspect it through a microscope to make sure we don't have any scratches or any problems happening. Because if we fail to do that, then we have to go all the way back to the beginning, back to the grinding process. So we're continually inspecting these surfaces as we grind them and polish them. So here we are in the testing facility and we're using our Zygo phase shifting laser interferometer. And this is a state-of-the-art piece of equipment. We can test optics horizontally, we can measure focal length, we can measure wave front, we can test individual surfaces using very expensive spheres that we've bought, or we can test objectives. And the way we've set this up is rather unique. We obtained this zero door, 140th wave optical flat, and instead of testing horizontally, as is usually done, uh, the beam comes out, strikes the optical flat at 45 degrees. So it, the laser shoots up through our objective at full aperture. Now, of course, it's going through a lens, so it starts to focus down. And when it gets to this point, it hits a very accurate optical sphere that reverses the beam exactly as it went up. So now it strikes it again, again at full aperture, passes through the lens once more, hits the optical flat and goes into the zygo for analyzation. This is a double pass. In other words, it's going through the lens twice. So it's going to show us twice the error that this lens would normally have. All right, now you mentioned that it's unusual. You've got a horizontal capability and you've gone to this effort to do it vertically. Yes. Why? Uh, good question. The reason that we're doing it is so that we can lay the lens down, we can unscrew the retaining ring so there's no additional pressure on the lens. And then when we look at the test result, we can then take a suction cup and we can loosen, we can rotate one element at a time, five degrees at a time. Do the top, then do the bottom. And every time we rotate it and we retest the uh, the the objective, we can see how it changes the optical accuracy. And so by rotating five degrees at a time on each surface, we are finding the best rotational alignment of that objective. And we can usually get it up one strill point or more. Now that's an awful lot of work to do just for one strill point, but we're all about perfection here. So we take this extra time just to dial it in in this regard, but we're still not to the magic. Oh, okay. So you mentioned the term strel that people have probably heard, but I'm not sure everybody is quite clear on what it is. Yes. And this is a situation where if you've got a telescope objective, when it focuses a star, it focuses it down into a little point of light. And if you were to magnify that, you would see a bright central core called the airy disk surrounded by diffraction rings. Correct. And for every type of optical design, there is a theoretical maximum amount of light that can be put into that central airy disk. Right. And the Strel ratio that people talk about is the actual amount of light that gets put into, into it. Disc, yeah. So if you had theoretically perfect optics, they would be 100, or it would be a Strel ratio of 1.00. Which is theoretically impossible, but you're right, that would be a perfect lens. All right, so your, your, your lenses, I mean, before you start to optimize them, where are you in your Strel ratios often? Well, if we use all the proper polishing techniques that are, are done, um, we can get a lens and assemble it randomly and come up with something around the 95, uh, 0.95 uh, really? range. Yeah, and that was normally considered to be as good as you needed to be. Uh, that was before we learned how to optimize even more than we have up to that point. So, we, But you have to go just beyond machine polishing to get to that kind of number. What do you have to do? Well, we have to hand figure and we have to make special polishing tools to attack every individual lens. Um, let, me, let me just say that when we get a lens in here and optimize it, we, we analyze it on the Zygo and we, we actually map the objective and we look at that and we decide now what kind of tools are, is it going to take for us to take this minor, minor issue and improve it. 
So we have to make special tooling for that lens and we have to hand figure that lens and or we have to hand figure that lens. And so by doing that, we can get our Strill Ratio up to 9.8 or 9.9, which is just stunning. This is why I had said earlier in this video, it's the difference between making a really good objective and making something which is world class, yes. a, an outstanding right. optic. Right. It's as good as it gets, yeah. yeah. Now, I notice you've got one in the test stand right now. Mm -hmm. You want to show me a little bit about what's going on on the screen here? Uh, sure. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at a highly magnified picture of that uh, optical wavefront. Every one of these little bumps is magnified tremendously. So this is not what the objective looks like. But what we're trying to do is to get this number down here, this strill ratio number, above 0.95, which is what we can get from machine polishing, into the 9899 realm, which we've done with this particular objective that's on our Zygo right at the moment. Okay, now here's what a lens might look like when it comes um, out of polishing, out of machine polishing. Uh, almost 0.95, this particular lens would probably test at a little above 9.5, uh, depending on the air currents in this room. Now, I first of all want to point out that this little bump here is just a uh, ding that happens to be currently in our corrector flat. So that really isn't there. Uh, secondly, what I'd like to point out is that in this oblique uh, plot, everything is reversed. So, this isn't a deep trench going around the, the center. This is actually a raised area, and this edge isn't going up, it's going down. We have here a turned down edge. Very common problem in, in creating optics. So our goal is going to be to get this surface to look flatter, which will bring the strill ratio number up, and that will uh, make a more corrected lens. And what's the difference? Visually, you're going to see with a 0.98 or 0.99 lens far more contrast and detail. Detail on the planets, for example. And it's also going to make a better imaging scope. So now we have optimized the wavefront of the objective, and so it's perfect. We're going to go ahead and take the uh, objective. We're going to number the elements so we make sure that we put the right ones together, and we wrap them very carefully, and we send them off to the coder. And the coder puts a broadband anti-reflective coating on all surfaces. This is a full multi-layer coating. It goes way beyond the visual spectrum. And the reason we go way beyond the visual spectrum is these telescopes aren't just used for visual, but they're also used for imaging. And since CCD chips see well above and below the visual spectrum, we need to make sure we're not seeing any reflections in that part of the spectrum. Yep. So all, all the surfaces inside and out are coated. Are full multi-coated. Then they come back here, they get assembled into an objective, and we test the lens once more on the Zygo. And that's when we do our final test. We print out that report. We make two copies. One copy stays here, the other copy goes to the customer. And that copy, that, that interferometric test report, becomes the customer's bragging rights. That's the report card on his or her objective. Excellent. I notice also, uh, you didn't mention the, the blackening on the edges there? That's true. Um, once we finish the lenses, we also like to edge blacken. You know, there's some thought about whether this does any good or not. Uh, it, it, the, uh, the theory behind it is that it eliminates sidewall reflections. We do it because we think it probably does make a difference. But uh, I've, I've, I've debated this fact with opticians uh, left and right. But we are edge blackening the elements. This piece of paper amounts to bragging rights. So at this point in the process, our production manager assembles and columnates the telescope and ensures it passes the optical and laser alignment tests. And then we perform the final test, a star test, to make sure everything is as it should be. After that, it goes to QC, where we make sure it's clean and it's spotless and correctly outfitted. I should mention one thing about the star test, our final star test. First of all, we're the first to get to see that perfect star test through a telescope. But for a telescope maker, after a month of hard work, to see that final star test is an inspiring moment. I can imagine what that's like. This is probably a good time to take a look at some of your finished telescopes. This is our flagship, our 152 millimeter F8 Apo triplet. This is the telescope that dreams are made of. In fact, I have one of these in my backyard. These are our two 102 millimeter Apo triplet telescopes. 
one with a carbon fiber tube, the other completely identical except for it uses an aluminum tube. It really depends on what people prefer. We decided to mount these two on our new version of the M2 mount. We've now made the M2 in a dual mount configuration. Many people love the 102s because of their extreme portability, but those that can afford a slightly larger telescope, they love our 130, our 5.1 inch uh, Pachromat. This telescope shows a lot more detail and reaches further in terms of deep sky objects. As you notice, we've outfitted these telescopes with our own Optimus 100 degree eyepieces. These are the eyepieces that we recommend for our premier apochromatic refractors. This is our newest telescope and we're really pretty proud of it because it, it attacks problems in different ways. This is our 80 millimeter wide field astrograph and uh, imagers can use this. It can also be used visually because the reducer or the flattener can be installed or taking out. You can be using this visually or photographically and the beauty of that is you can shoot at f6 or f4.5 and get an enormous wide field views. We did a number of things with this. We put a three inch focuser on it so there would be no focuser induced vignetting. We have solid rings that are rigidly mounted to the plate so there will be no felt flexure in this telescope. Uh, imagers look for things like that because I tell you it's very tricky doing astrophotography. So we've listened to them and we've come up with this particular design so that uh, they could do a much better job at imaging. Is the focal reducer part of the system or is that an option? That is an option, a very good question. The system does come with a field flattener and optionally they could also add a reducer flattener that we've created for this which actually fits inside the focuser draw tube. Well, Dennis, I really want to thank you for coming by and giving me the opportunity to demonstrate how we make world-class refractors. I've wanted to do a video like this for years, and to have you be able to come here with Sky and Telescope and to let us demonstrate what it takes, I think is a great, uh, a great thing. I really enjoy being here. I hope viewers will enjoy seeing what it is that you do and the extreme efforts that you go to to create the telescopes mm. that you're making. So I appreciate it and I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Take All care. Right.